Venezuela is the land of the tepuis and of exotic beaches. But inland there is another treasure of nature, still largely undiscovered. The basin of the Orinoco, lying between the Andes to the west, the coastal mountain range to the north, and the Guiana Massif to the southeast. It is so completely flat that it has been named the region of the plains. Almost all the rains fall in a single season, and so the ecosystem of the plains alternates between extremes of flood and drought. It is a land of contrasts, a little visited paradise of surprisingly rich and varied fauna and flora. The Apure River runs across the plain flanked by thick vegetation. Here, ever alert, lives the wood ibis, also known as the American ibis or forest stork. Every year, they build their nests along the banks of the river and feed on the animals that live in its waters. Thousands of birds of many different species have found on these plains their perfect natural habitat. The Orinoco Basin covers an area of 300,000 square kilometers and its many rivers and marshes provide sufficient food and water to support a great variety of animals. There are, for example, more species of bird here than in the whole of the United States. The soil is poor and the only places trees can really grow is along the banks of the rivers. The thick vegetation here stands in stark contrast to the vast empty spaces beyond. Trees are always a sure sign that a river or stream is nearby. In January, after a year of wandering from the Orinoco Basin down to the Amazon in search of good land, the ibises stop to build their nests. Once they have found a suitable tree, the pairs of birds take just a few days to build their nests, in which they will incubate from two to five eggs. They prefer the small islands in the rivers or trees right by the riverbank, with trunks going straight down into the water. Here, the ibises are safe from the land predators and can hatch their young in relative peace. Both parents share the task of looking after the chicks, taking it in turns to fish, so they are never left alone. Like its close relative, the Indian ibis, their fishing tactics rely on the sensitivity of their beaks which means they can detect fish without seeing them. This is an invaluable skill here in the plains, where many of the waters of the rivers are muddy and the fish are hidden. The largest freshwater turtles in the world, the Arauz, don't share the ibis's paternal instincts. Once they have laid between 60 and 100 eggs in a hole dug in the ground, the parents consider their job done and pay no further thought to their offspring. That's generally the way with reptiles, with the exception of crocodiles and alligators, as this animal, the caracara, well knows. He is an expert egg thief. A caracara has found the eggs thanks to the urine-soaked earth covering them. Both he and his mate know what is hidden here, and they start digging for their treasure. They've already dug up the first egg. 
Once they have found a store of food, they will keep coming back until not a single egg is left. The turtles are not the only victims of the caracaras. At this time of year, an even greater delicacy is in abundance, the ibis chicks. In the first stages of growth, the chicks are very vulnerable and the caracaras are busy searching for an unprotected nest. This chick is alone and has been spotted by its predators. The first caracara lands close to the nest and looks up searching the sky to make sure the parents are not nearby. Another ibis standing nearby poses no threat. She will only protect her own chicks. Certain that there is no danger, the caracara goes into action. In the water, the alligators and the piranhas wait for something to fall in. Meanwhile, the caracaras calmly devour the chick they have found, while the other ibises stand impassively by. Before the parents return, the predators will have gone back to their nests out on the plains, leaving behind the remains of the chick. It is too heavy for them to carry, but they will come back tomorrow to finish it off, provided no other caracara has got there first. Most of the soil on the plains is clay, which prevents drainage. With the coming of the rains, the level of the rivers rises, and because the land is so flat, and the soil non-porous, many marshes are formed. The majority of them will disappear in the dry season. But as the ground is flooded, the seeds that had been left buried in the mud the year before spring to life, covering the waters in dense vegetation. Water hyacinths rapidly coat the surface of the lagoon. There are more now than ever since the herbivores that feed on them have been reduced in numbers. These plants can now be seen in almost all the marshes of the plains. The hyacinths don't bury their roots in the soil, but rather float feeding on the nutrients carried along by the water. In this way, they can drift with the current and so easily colonize new territories. The lack of roots is an advantage not only for the plants. It also means that fish and reptiles can move about freely below the surface of the water, like the anaconda. The hyacinths also provide a place to hide, a form of camouflage. Some young animals, like this alligator, are vulnerable during the early stages of growth and are in danger from the jabiru storks, wood ibises and caracaras. The vegetation along the river banks is a safe place in which to hide until they are able to defend themselves. The number of water hyacinths is kept in check above all by this rodent, the capybara. With its webbed feet and nostrils placed high up on its head, it is perfectly adapted to life in the water. It stays there for many hours during the day, eating the aquatic plants before moving on to the grass of the plains at dusk, when the temperature becomes bearable. The capybara, weighing in at 50 kilos, is the largest rodent on Earth.
The males can be easily distinguished from the females by the gland on their foreheads. They rub this gland against the vegetation, leaving a smell which is recognized by all others of their species. They regularly renew the marks that separate their territory from that of other adult males. The majority of their territory is covered in water. After a gestation period of four months, the capybaras give birth to between two and eight young. The mating season is time to ensure that they are born at the end of the rainy season when conditions are at their best and the chances of survival greatest. Around 50% survive, which gives us some idea of the demographic potential of these rodents. However, even this is not enough to ensure an increase in population from one year to the next. The capybara has a serious problem. Their meat is much appreciated by the herdsmen of the region and is traditionally eaten at Easter. Every year, many are killed and every year the population goes down a little more. In the past, their main predator was the Orinoco crocodile. Now, the greatest enemy is man the same men who have driven the crocodile to the verge of extinction. The Orinoco Plains could well be a smaller version of the Amazon Basin. Geomorphological conditions are very similar. But the type of vegetation is determined above all by the climate. During the rainy season, 95% of the plains are flooded, whereas by the end of the dry season, much of the area is barren desert. This is the most difficult time of year on the plains, and many of the animals born during the rainy season will simply die. The buzzard, the commonest vulture in South America, plays an important role at this time of year, which is not always recognized. By clearing away dead bodies, they help prevent infection to both wild animals and cattle. The dry season is also a time of plenty for the alligators. As water becomes scarce, the pools shrink, the fish are trapped and so are easy to catch. The head and tail, both held erect, tell us this is a dominant male. No other alligator would dare compete with him for food, and in any case, at this time of year, there is enough for everyone. The ibis chicks have grown and need less and less food. Because the fish are concentrated in small areas, the adults can make one last effort to ensure the survival of all their young. The piranhas, which once devoured any chicks that fell from their nests, have now become the prey of their former victims. This season is also hard for the land mammals especially the need to keep cool during the hottest part of the day. As the dry season continues, the fish die out. 
but by that time the ibis chicks will be fully grown and able to fly. The flocks then leave in search of better lands, either across the plains or further south towards the Amazon. The drier the season, the greater the migration. They will not return until the next rainy season. The caracaras also take advantage of the drying up of the waters and eat more fish. Now that the ibis chicks are fully grown and no longer vulnerable, the stranded fish provide a good alternative diet. Although they have the beak of a bird of prey, the caracaras are in fact omnivores and even eat aquatic plants. Sometimes, as we can see here, they are also scavengers, as long as the dead animal is not in an advanced state of putrefaction. region is divided into two main areas, on the one hand the so-called low plains closest to the Orinoco. This is where the climate is most extreme and the poor soils mean there are few trees. Grass is the main vegetation. Nearer the mountains lie the high plains, where the climate is more favorable, the vegetation denser. These are the Pauhuis. For most of the year they are solitary birds or live in pairs, but with the arrival of the dry season they congregate in large groups wherever water can be found. Many other species of bird also flock to these areas during this season. On the high plains floods are less frequent and less dramatic than lower down. The rivers carry less water and the landscape is more uneven, so when a river does flood over, it doesn't cover the whole area. There are fewer marshes in the rainy season and pools are rare in the dry season. All the animals in the area are drawn to the few pools there are. Some, like the cormorants, are attracted by the abundance of fish, while others simply want to drink. After several months of drought, the level of the pools and lakes is extremely low, and the water is so crowded with fish, it seems to shake and tremble. Some alligators leave the river and move to the lagoon. Here there is plenty of food, and it is easier to fish. The alligators are also good news for the birds. The more reptiles there are in the center of the pool, the more fish concentrate around the edges. On the shore and in the branches of the trees, the birds wait for their chance. It's not long before a fish comes close enough to be caught. The presence of so many birds attracts predators who prowl around close to the water. This means the shores are dangerous places and the capuchin monkeys stay on the ground only as long as is strictly necessary. These are perhaps the most intelligent monkeys of the plains. Both their social structure and their means of communication are very highly developed. The pool is their only source of water, 
and sooner or later they have to come down to drink. On the ground, they are easy prey for the carnivores and must remain on their guard as they quench their thirst. At this time of year, it's rare to see birds on the dry grasslands. This pair of Jabiru storks is probably looking for insects or reptiles to supplement their diet. But they spend the majority of their time near water, where they also find their main food, fish. There's always an exception to the rule. This owl lives permanently on the dry grasslands. For their nests, they use the burrows of another inhabitant of the plains, the striped armadillo. The forests along the banks of the rivers are home to one of the strangest birds in the world, the Hoatzin. The Oatsin is totally unique. It is so extraordinary that it is believed to be related to the Archaeopteryx, the oldest prehistoric bird known to man. It is herbivorous, living almost exclusively on the young shoots, leaves and fruit of two trees, the Arum and the white mangrove. As well as food, these trees provide water, so the birds rarely need to go down to drink. The Oatsin needs a long time to digest its food, in this, they are more like mammals than birds. Its stomach can be up to 25% of its total weight, which means it has had to reduce the size of its sternum. The chest muscles have also been affected and are smaller than normal for a bird of this size. As they have lost strength, flight has become more difficult and they merely glide short distances between the trees where they live. The Jabiru storks, on the other hand, fly great distances from their nests in the early morning in search of food. At sunset, they return to their homes on the many islands in the Apure River. Hundreds of birds come back to the river every evening to the safety of the islands where they will spend the night. So, the tributaries of the Orinoco offer both protection and food. These waters form the marshes and are the real source of life here on the plains. The guarantee that this will remain in the future what it is today, a paradise in the center of Venezuela.